Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. When studying about our Lord and Savior, there are two things that we need to understand and understand well. The first we talked about last week. We remember that Peter, he said something so true and vital. And what was that? When Messiah says, who do you say that I am? He responded, you are the son of the living God. Now that speaks about Messiah's identity, that he is the son of God, that is, he is divine and the second member of the Trinity. We speak about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we learned last week concerning his identity. He is the divine Son of God and the only divine Son of God. There is no one like him. What we're going to focus in on in our study this evening is not his identity, but his work. Theologians speak about the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 16. The book of Matthew and chapter 16. We're going to begin in verse 21. And notice there is a transition. We read in this first verse we're going to study tonight, verse 21, these words. From then, meaning this, from that moment, we see that there was a change. Yeshua, he set his face towards Jerusalem. And we're going to read that very clearly. But notice something that's very important. He's going up to Jerusalem. And why is that? because of a festival one of the lord's appointed days and we're speaking about passover we need to remember that the apostle paul spoke of messiah as our passover lamb and i share with you many times that passover we need to understand it as the festival of redemption but when we speak about passover realize there's a very important word and concept that needs to come into our mind and what is that it is death on passover there is death we see that going all the way back 3500 years ago at the first passover in egypt someone had to die and there was two options either the passover lamb and in doing so there would be a wonderful outcome that death would bring about redemption but if someone did not keep the passover what was the other alternative death through the death of the firstborn but again when we think about passover death should come into our mind messiah he's going up to jerusalem and it's passover time and notice what he says once more verse 21 and then that means from that moment Yeshua began to show to his disciples that it was necessary for him. And I would highlight that expression. Now, in the biblical language, in the Greek language, there's just one very small word, three letters. It is the Greek word day. And that word day means it is necessary. And here's the important truth concerning this word. It speaks about something that is absolutely necessary if God's will is going to be produced. If God's purpose, his plan is going to be fulfilled. So this is not an option. This is not a preference. It is an absolute necessity. And every time this word appears in the Bible, 
it speaks just to that and absolute necessary for the will of god the purposes of god the plans of god to be fulfilled so messiah from that moment he began to show his disciples that it was necessary for him to go away meaning depart from the galilee to go into jerusalem and notice this next phrase and and i want to translate it very literally and in the exact order in the greek text the next word that appears is the word much and it's emphatic that means it's being emphasized now normally in most english translations it simply says that he's going to go to jerusalem and he will suffer many things that's not what it says it says literally much he's going to suffer so the emphasis is not just on his suffering but the fact that he suffers much in a great deal and realize another important biblical truth because messiah suffered much that word is a word of significance therefore there is great significance to that suffering and notice specifically what's going to happen once more and much to suffer from the elders the chief priests and the scribes who did these three groups represent the elders the chief priests and the scribes were talking about the jewish religious leadership but also also the government of israel now who are we not speaking about we're not speaking about the jewish people in a general sense but rather we're speaking about the leadership and it's very clear the jewish leadership not the jewish people but the leadership were very much against him and this simply foreshadows that he is and here's the key word he is rejected absolutely rejected all of us are guilty all of us because it was my sin and your sin that that brought about god's plan because of god's great love because he's a gracious merciful forgiving god to bring what we're speaking about to pass and that is the crucifixion of messiah that's why he went to jerusalem on that passover to lay down his life and we read he will suffer much from the elders the chief priests and the scribes and not just suffer but and to die now this word for die is in the passive which means he will be put to death now we need to realize two things messiah he laid down his life no one took it from him he willfully went to jerusalem he knew what is he speaking about now he's teaching the disciples that he's going to jerusalem to do just that to die he submitted to that and we learned that at his immersion when he was baptized in the jordan river when he submitted to his father's plan and purpose and now it's simply being carried out so he's going to suffer much and also to be put to death but here's the key and on the third day be risen now it literally says not on the third day although i don't dispute that but literally if we pay attention to the greek case it's in the dative what does that mean for the purpose of for the sake of it teaches us something see in the bible the number three is important and also the concept the third day let me give you an example one of the most important passages and as we study this passage and i'm referring to akidat yitzchak that is the binding of isaac in genesis 22 we learn a lot about messiah his work what's going to happen to him his death god's provision this sacrifice was for the purpose of life the binding of isaac in genesis 22 is a highly significant passage that that casts light upon the person and the work of messiah but realize something else when we look at genesis 22 and verse 4 we learn something the scripture says this all came about 
on the third day. There's also another highly significant and well-known verse from the, the prophecy of Hosea. Now, I call him Hosea, his Hebrew name, you know him by Hosea. And the reason why I emphasize Hosea is because his name means the one who makes, he who causes salvation. And if you look sometime in, in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2, we find that, that on the third day, check this out, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, on the third day has great significance. It speaks about revival. It is a kingdom expression, the third day. And therefore, Messiah, his death had a purpose. And it says here, for the sake of the third day, yes, he rose from the dead on the third day, but the language here speaks about a kingdom purpose. It ties for us the concept of resurrection and kingdom. Now, verse 22. Peter, all the disciples, remember, he began to show to his disciples, but as always, Peter steps out. And what did he do? Verse 22. And Peter, taking Yeshua aside. Now, literally, it's just taking him aside, but we're speaking about the Savior. He began to do something. What did Peter do? He began, and this is a very strong word, he began to rebuke him, saying. And what did Peter say in rebuking? Well, there's an expression. Now, we all know in English the expression, the Lord have mercy. It usually speaks about something that is, is not good, not right, something bad news. And this is how Peter assumed this statement about his death and his resurrection. But again, this was why he was sent into this world, in order to die for you and for me, to pay the price so that we could experience redemption and realize one of the outcomes of redemption is the privilege of worshiping God. So Peter began to take him aside and rebuke him, saying, basically, God forbid that, that this should be to you, Lord. Now, this shows something. It shows a, a degree of, of poor understanding on Peter's part. He calls him Lord, but he's rebuking him. I mean, if he's the Lord, a disciple doesn't ever rebuke his master. But Peter, in this boldness that was misplaced, this understanding that was not rooted in prophetic truth because the prophet said over and over that Messiah would suffer, that he would die. And also we know that important truth about resurrection. That's just not a New Testament concept. We also see the concept of resurrection in the Hebrew Bible in the Old Testament. But Peter, he wasn't being led by spiritual truth. He was being led by, and this is very dangerous, he was being led by his emotions. So he rebuked him and he said, Lord, have mercy if this is ever to you. And then he says, no, no. Now, these two words, it's two different words for negative. No, no. And what it speaks of is a concept of never. So we could translate this. This shall never be to you. So he is in opposition of the cross. Now, oftentimes today, we see a lessening of the cross being taught and, and preached and, and presented. Why? You know what the cross says? How sinful I am. That the only way that I could be forgiven, the only way, that I could experience the love of God was through the cross. We need to exalt the cross. We need to esteem it. We need to share it. But too frequently, we do not put the proper significance upon it. We don't emphasize the cross nor the shedding of his blood, his death that he died because of sin. See, if you don't talk much about sin, 
the cross is not going to be something that is likewise that you spend a lot of time on. So we read, look now to, to verse 23, the, the second part. Notice what Yeshua says to Peter. He says, turning, verse 23, and this one, meaning Messiah, Turn, and literally he was caused to turn by what Peter was saying. He turned and said to Peter, get behind me. And what did he call Peter? Satan. Why? Because Satan, he is the adversary and he stands eternally against the purposes of God. And when we stand in opposition to biblical truth, we are displaying a, a satanic perspective rather than the, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. So Yeshua says, verse 23, he says, Get behind me, Satan, for, and now he speaks about being a fence, you are my, and the word here means a stumbling block or a fence to, to me. Why is that? Look at the last part of verse 23. Because you are not thinking the thoughts of God, but the thoughts of man. Now, let's understand this right. Here was Peter's problem. Peter was thinking the thoughts of a man. Why was he doing that? Because he's a man. We, if we're going to be pleasing to God, we cannot operate as a natural man. That's why when we look, for example, at Ephesians we see Paul speaking about the new man being a new creation. And what brings this about? Obviously, it comes through an experience of salvation. It comes through the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit, causing us to be that new creation by means of the Holy Spirit. We need the mind of Messiah. Without the mind of Christ, we cannot see things correctly. We cannot make God-pleasing decisions. And we're going to find ourselves without the mind of Messiah in opposition, having a satanic perspective rather than the perspective of God. So it's quite significant that he says here to Peter that you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of man. You need to ask yourself, how are you thinking? What really is the emphasis of your life? Is it the things of God or is the emphasis of your life the things of man? Verse, verse 24. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, and this is at the heart of spirituality. I mean, we've learned who Messiah is, the son of the living God. We learned what he's going to do, that he's going to go to Jerusalem much to suffer and to be put to death. But we also see what our response should be for this. Now, this may not be popular. It is certainly not in line with what many people refer to as a prosperity gospel. But, but notice, these are important things. This context is highly significant. And what does he say to true disciples? Look again at verse 24. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, If anyone desires once after me to follow, and there's a key, after me, showing submissiveness, after me to follow, let him deny himself. Now, here's the heart of our faith. Whether we call it Messianic Judaism or Christianity, same thing. At the heart of our faith is denying ourself. Now, you see the conflict? It's not about an earthly prosperity. It is about, in earth, denying yourself. Is that not what he says? Am I wrong in that? If we're going to follow after him, if we're going to be led by the Spirit, we have a call, we have an expectation, and that is that we must deny ourselves. What? The things of this world. Why? Because we're pursuing the kingdom of God. So he says very clearly to everyone, it's very inclusive. If anyone wants after me to come, meaning to follow, let him deny himself and do what? 
and let him take up his cross and follow me. You know what that tells me? It tells me that we, as a believer, we have a cross to bear. Here again, what's he saying to true disciples, those who love him and want to follow him? It's this, that we are going to have to deny ourselves those selfish things, those fleshly things, what many people think is their destiny. Usually, when someone speaks about their destiny, it's really satanic propaganda. We need to crucify those things, nail them to the cross, and accept a new life, God's plan for our life. And that involves, does he not say this? Taking up your cross. I need to take up my cross. Meaning this, we are going to suffer and maybe called to die for our faith. That's what he says here. If anyone wants to follow me, let him take up his cross and then follow me. Verse 25. For anyone who desires his, and it's literally the word soul, but, but in Hebrew, and I realize this is Greek, but the mindset is Hebraic because we can use the word nephesh for also life. It talks about the essence of our life. So he says here, if anyone wants to save his life, what happens? It says here, he will lose it. But if anyone loses his life, and here's the key, for my sake. What happens if we do that? He will find it. We are called to lay down our life. We are called to suffer. And here's the key, this great phrase, on account of me. That's what Messiah says. We're supposed to lose our life. Everything that we were pursuing prior to coming to the knowledge of the truth, prior to being born again by the Spirit, this regeneration, we have a new mindset. So it's not about accumulating things in this world. It's about laying them aside, denying ourselves, being willing to die for our faith, and in doing so, we will find life. What type of life? Kingdom life. That's what he's speaking to in this passage of Scripture. Verse 26. For what does it profit a man? This is true universally for every individual. This has relevance for you. And if you stumble over this, if you do not understand it, you are going to be eternally distraught because of it. It's not a hard concept to understand. He says once more, verse 26, for if anyone, or he asks the question, for what does it profit a man if the whole world he should gain, gain everything in the world, but his life he should lose? Now, it's just that simple. People are going to be seeking the things of this world, and when they pursue that, they're losing the things of the kingdom, those kingdom rewards. So he makes it very clear. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but his soul he loses? Verse 26, the second part. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, what it's saying here is that if it's life, people almost would do anything to live. What would a man give in exchange for his life? I'll tell you what it is. It's the body and the blood of Messiah. That is what was given for your life. And you and I need to live with that understanding. That is what's given. What was God's payment? The life of his son the suffering that he went through. And why was he willing to do it? Two reasons. One, he loved you. Secondly, so that his kingdom could be established and that you could be part of that kingdom. So what would a man give in exchange for his life? Well, we can't give anything. It's what God gave in our behalf. Verse 27. For, and the next word is a word for future, about, 
and it demands an expectation, being ready. So literally it says, for the Son of Man is about, or in the future, he will come with or in the glory of his Father. That's what excites me, the glory of his Father. And that glory is a kingdom glory. That's what you should be pursuing, life eternal in the kingdom of God with his glory. So we read, for in the future or about, however you want to translate this word, mele in Greek, the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And, and here's the key, he will give to each one according to his work, his action. By the way, many English puts it in the plural according to his deeds, but it's in the singular. Why? You know what that deed is? Because we're talking about salvation here. And that deed, according to his deed, is if we accepted the gospel or not. That's why it's in the singular. It's what we've done with him. Have we esteemed him, acknowledged him as the only begotten Son of God? And do we understand his work? That he died upon that cross for us. He rose from the dead, signifying victory. Remember that third day, a victorious day. In the book of Genesis, we see the fulfillment of God's revelation to Abraham in that binding of Isaac that all took place, Genesis 22, verse 4, on the third day. Let's conclude. Finally, he says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they shall see. This is a word of perceiving, perception. Until they shall see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, some that are standing there that day that will see him coming in the kingdom, what was he speaking about? Well, we're going to see when we enter into chapter 17 next week that that expression when he says there are some, not all the disciples, just a few, they witness his transfiguration, how Messiah is going to appear in the kingdom of God. That transfiguration has so much significance for us, and that is going to be the subject of our study next week when we come together to learn biblical truth. Until then, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.